I'm not a man with many talents. I've been blessed to preach and to speak thousands of times. I can't recall a time where I've ever feared public speaking, but I stand here today with deep humility, recognizing the privilege and the awesome responsibility to come to a standing before each of you courageous individuals. Like many of you, I grew up in a first responder family. I was born in 1958. My earliest and fondest memories involved being around first responders. My father became a Memphis police officer the year that I was born. I still recall riding with him to Armor Station and our old Ford Falcon and watching him joke around with men that appeared bigger than life to me. The men of that era were giants in my life. They were my heroes. My Uncle Joe, Joseph T. Dunn, the greatest man that I've ever known, would become a Memphis police officer in the mid-60s. I would join the Memphis Police Department in 1978 as a dispatcher. My little brother would become a Shelby County Sheriff's Deputy in 1997, and my youngest cousin is now an officer with the Collierville Police Department. So you see, my life has revolved around relationships with men and women who are first responders. I recall from an early age that it didn't seem like anything scared my dad. The only thing that I ever saw shake him was the death of one of the officers that he worked with. As a matter of fact, the first one that I recall vividly was the death of Patrolman David Clark of the Memphis Police Department. And after that event, I watched as my father and my uncle, two Memphis police officers and my heroes, grieve separately and together. I experienced my first taste of the horror associated with the line of duty death when I worked as a dispatcher in the old radio room at 120 Adams. It was early in the morning of May 1981 when a West Precinct Lieutenant, Clarence Cox, went missing. He didn't respond to his radio, and you could hear the cars throughout the downtown area searching for him. West Precinct officers would eventually find him slain outside of his squad car around Lauderdale Courts. Lieutenant Cox was shot and killed while attempting to arrest a suspect who had walked away from a work release program. The suspect was able to gain control of Lieutenant Cox's service weapon and shoot him with it and later on take that service weapon and kill a Roman Catholic priest. He was arrested in Jackson, Tennessee. He was sentenced to death, but he never made it to the state executioner because he was murdered in prison by other death row inmates. Just three months later, after Clarence Cox, Lieutenant Clarence Cox's death, I was working the night Lieutenant Ronnie Oliver was murdered while responding to a silent alarm call at Wendy's on Thomas. A year and a half later, MPD Communications was moved to its current location at the 12th floor to a one poplar. I got a call from my supervisor asking me to come in to work early because there was a hostage situation. When I arrived, I found out that Patrolman Robert Hester had been taken hostage was being beaten to death by a group of demon-possessed, ghoulish individuals on Shannon Street in North Memphis. I still remember the demonic voice of the psychotic cult leader as he spoke over Patrolman Hester's radio. I listened and watched as the lives of the brave men and women who were on that scene had to hear this brave public servant cry out for his life, and they had to hold out their positions for 30 hours before the nightmare ended. The life of every tact officer, every patrolman, every commander on that scene that night changed forever. Now I recall those events on the job because I wanted to let you know the job has always been difficult and it's always been challenging. But the world that you are working in, that you encounter, is not the same as it was in 1958 or 1981, or 1983. The anger in the country is palpable, and first responders inexplicably have become the lightning rod. I say inexplicably because those who protest the loudest don't get to see what I see. On a daily basis, I see young men and women that operate with remarkable restraint, professionalism under the most adverse of circumstances. The sheer numbers of police officers, deputy sheriffs, firefighters, state troopers, air wing personnel, and first responders that have given their life for the citizens of this country is staggering. 
just 40 to 50 yards from where I stand over in that direction lies the remains of my baby brother, Shelby County Sheriff's Deputy Tim Dunn, who gave his life in the line of duty in October of 2004. He was my best friend, and I miss him every day. I think about him multiple times every day. Losing him continues to affect me in profound ways. It may seem humorous to you, but I look in the mirror every day and I can tell his death has aged me. Now, I'm not trying to get anybody to feel sorry for me, but you see, I joined a family on October the 29th, 2004 that I didn't want to join, didn't know I was going to have to join, and that family is the family of survivors. I cannot describe or depict the bravery of the individuals in this broken and wounded family. All of us in the survivor family have experienced the overwhelming love that's showered upon us by the various agencies when the lives of our loved ones are snuffed out. And each one of us has heard the co-workers of our loved ones state with good intentions that they will never forget our hero and that they'll be there for us and that they'll always be by our side. But you know what? Life happens. Life goes on. Time moves on and friends move forward with their own lives. And the friends occasionally remember the names of the individuals on the wall with fondness. But for the surviving family member, time stands still. Survivors learn to cope and live with the pain, but the loss is always in our heart and on our minds. Birthdays, holidays, anniversaries, memorials, even the anniversary dates of the death bring back memories like a flood. And survivors relive everything, and the pain is real. In fact, probably the greatest fear that every survivor has is the fear that the sacrifice of their hero will be forgotten. So on behalf of the survivors, I'd like to say thank you for continuing this tribute. Memorial services like this would provide comfort that our fallen family members will be remembered in perpetuity. Now to all the brave first responders here, I'd like to encourage you in just a, one or two areas and then I'll take my seat. I know these are times of extreme frustration. We live in difficult economic times. It stings when benefits and salaries are compared to those who work in private industry. I, I, I mean no disrespect, but the comparisons between working as a first responder and working in private industry are like comparing apples to oranges. No other profession faces the daily possibility that they'll have had to fight to stay alive because someone was trying to take their weapon from them. No other profession has to respond to a scene where a child's been maimed or killed and you don't want to look and you don't want to deal with it because you see the face of your child on the dead child but you have to suck it up and take care of business and the memory of that child will haunt you forever. No other profession has to rush into buildings that are raging infernos to save those who cannot save themselves. No other profession jumps into a helicopter to scoop up the critically injured and fly them to the nearest hospital where they'll have a fighting chance to live. You see, you deal with death and destruction and danger on a daily basis. No other profession sets a goal at the beginning of their work day to just survive the day and to go home to their families in one piece. That frustration can make you bitter and jaded. But please remember what I'm about to tell you. All of us remember where we were when the horrible scenes occurred on September the 11th, 2011. I remember watching the masses that had the good sense running from the World Trade Center to take cover and to find safety. But there was another group of people that ran toward the blast springing into action to provide first aid and assistance. They were you, and they were your brethren. The media and the citizens look at that and they wonder, what makes a person act that way? You're a mystery to most of them because they don't have a clue about your training or what you face when things bad happen in the blink of an eye. Television's made them think that when someone shoots at you, you ought to be able to shoot the gun out of their hand or shoot them in the shins to maim them. They especially don't understand the act of running toward a burning building or running toward a bomb site. And sometimes, if you're honest, 
you can't explain why you do what you do either. <clears throat> it certainly isn't for the pain. Well, if you'll allow me in these closing moments, I'd like to take a stab at an explanation that helps me. I'm a Christian. If you aren't, please don't take any offense. I, I'll fight for your right to worship that tree, if that's your preference. But Christianity is my faith tradition. The Bible is my guide, and it tells me that God orders my steps. I believe I can prove from the Bible that just like a preacher is called to preach, your steps have been ordered to become a law enforcement officer, a firefighter, or first responder. There is no other reason outside of insanity that an individual would perform the heroic acts that you perform outside of a calling of public, public service. Jesus Christ said, Greater love hath no man than that he lay down his life for his friends. You see, each of you understand that just like the names on this wall, you could be called to lay down your life for individuals that you don't even know. Now, God forbid that it happens to any of you. I don't want to see any more names added to this world. But I'm a realist. We live in a broken world. I mean, here we are today adding the name of a brave officer, Patrolman Sean Bolton, and his family grieves. Officer Bolton was the bravest of the brave. He surrendered to the high calling of military service for our country, and he returned home to ultimately give the greatest sacrifice as he was executed by a dastardly individual on the streets of Memphis. We already know that next year, another name of a brave public servant is going to be on that wall. Just a few weeks ago, Lieutenant Roddy, Roddy Edmonds, a 57-year-old veteran of the Memphis Fire Department, gave his life in leading his fellow firefighters into a burning home. The reality is that each of you have taken on a profession that calls you to step up, to be the watchman, to stand in the gap during times of crisis. I'll close with this. I, I was flipping through the television channels about six months ago, and I stumbled upon an episode of Adam 12 entitled Elegy for a Pig. I've not been able to delete it, and I've not been able to get it off of my mind. It was different than any other cop show that I had ever seen. To begin with, there was no dialogue. There was only narration from Martin Milner, who played Officer Pete Malloy. The gist of the show was showing Malloy and another officer as they began their careers as police officers at the training academy and the subsequent changes that would occur in their lives as they became friends and partners over the next six years. Malloy's friend and partner in the show is killed while pursuing a bad guy at one point. And the next few minutes examine the details of notifying the spouse and the family and are preparing for the funeral. An LAPD funeral is shown with full honors, the burial. And the point is, as everyone leaves the graveside, Malloy returns to the casket of his friend. And the haunting narrative picks up with these words. And if there must be a final postscript to all of this, let it there be noted. The coffin will soon be buried. He will be forgotten, except by a very few. Out of sight, out of mind. And strangely enough, in view of current custom, no one will raise a placard to denounce his senseless murder. No one will raise indignant cries of protest at the shedding of his innocent blood. No one will march in anger because of his death. Folks, I want to tell you those words were written in 1970. And they are just as relevant in 2016. You and I both know you'll never receive the full respect and appreciation that you're due this side of heaven. In spite of the obstacles and frustrations, please know that there are more individuals than you can fathom that love you and that pray for you daily. You are not the problem. You are the solution. I want to say I thank God for each of you, every one of you that's accepted this high calling. The city of Memphis, the county of Shelby, the United States of America, in my humble opinion, would not be worth living in without you. God bless you. God loves you. And remember the fallen heroes.